Hello, uh, good evening, buonasera. Um, so the topic that I have here is tagless indoor localization with artificial intelligence and capacitive sensing. So uh, here's the presentation outline. I will start with why we need such system, uh, what's the measurement principle, uh, experimental setup, and different AI algorithms and techniques that we use. And then I will conclude my presentation. So why we need indoor or a tagless indoor localization? So as you know, know that uh, in many countries now we, there, are, there is aging population and there are people who are living by themselves. So we need to see that if they are living okay, if they are performing their daily activities in fine way. So we can think of certain scenarios how we can achieve that. So one solution could be uh, you put cameras in their homes, uh, a camera in a living room, a camera in kitchen, uh, a camera in sleeping room, a camera in shower perhaps. Or another solution could be we can give them the other sort of sensors like mobile phone has many sensors. So we can ask them please hold your mobile phone all the time with you so we know that you are doing fine. Or we can ask them to wear a smart watch or something so we know that they are doing fine. But all these techniques would require the person uh, to carry something, to wear something, and what would happen if they forget to wear that? Or, I mean, we have also other devices like Alexa from Google, I assume, uh, where based on your daily activities, they would uh, see how, how you are doing. Um, but in all these, uh, there's also the problem of uh, these techniques are privacy invasive. So we want to secure the privacy of the person while uh, taking care that, okay, he is doing fine. So for that, we thought of uh, a system where the person do not have to perform certain activities, he do not have to carry certain devices, and the devices, and the whole system is uh, taking care of the privacy as well. So uh, here's a very brief summary also of the different aspects. For example, the um, if the if the system is low cost or how much processing power it needs, and uh, here's a quick comparison, and we come up with capacitive sensors because these sensing systems are the, our prototypes. They are fairly low cost, low power, and the processing they uh, is just for integer values that they need. Um, a very quick background of capacitive sensing. So you might remember from your high school physics, uh, it's about the charge that is stored between two plates. And we have different modes of capacitive sensing. Uh, there is shunt mode, and then there is transmit mode, and there is loading mode. So uh, in the shunt and transmit mode, we need two plates. Um, so, in, uh, if we imagine of the scenario, uh, if we can put one plate on one wall, another plate on the other wall, then we need to take care of like how we connect them electrically, and that would again require us to go through the uh, lengthy installation pr procedures and so on. So we focus on the loading mode, where we need a single plate, and the other the the environment acts as the second plate of the capacitor and we will see how it works. So uh, it works in something like that. There's a sensor plate that is a single plate um, capacit capacitive sensor. And we have a 555A stable multivibrator. So that is a fairly simple circuit. If you remember this 555 circuit with two, transist uh, with two resistors. And its frequency is dependent on what's the capacitance that is observed on this plate. Uh, in the normal circuitry, we put a capacitor there to achieve the whatever the required frequency is. But in our case, the capacitance is variable. S and um, we transmit it through the XB radios to our base station, which is a computer. Um, I was using MATLAB, and then we were logging the data. So it works something like this. So it forms the capacitance with the environment, and we achieve, we see a certain base frequency. And then we see a person, for example, nearby, and the frequency decreases. So that is uh, the very basic working principle of this sensor. 
So um, considering that, um, we thought of a room experiment. Uh, we designated a small space, three by three meter room, and it had the um, routine things that you might find in a room, uh, a fridge, a metal closet, electric switch, door, etc., etc. And we divided the space into 16 known positions. And we placed four sensors on each of the wall at the chest height. And each position is 60 meter away from uh, the other position. So what happens is that we start uh, our four sensors and a person stands on each of these positions. We gather the data. And then I move to the next position. I gather the data again. And that I continue for 16 positions. And this is something we get out of this data. So um, obviously, it has many troubles. Like uh, if you turn off the sensor and you turn on the sensor, uh, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention, each line here represents a different experimental run. So I gather the data on 16 positions. I turn it off. I turn it on, or after some time. I go back and then start taking the measurements again. So each line gives a different uh, level that I achieve. So each time I turn on the sensor, it makes a different uh, capacitance with the environment because of the changes in the charges, because of the uh, different temperature, humidity, and so on. So obviously, we have a certain problem here. So we need data pre-processing at this point. So what we do is. Uh, we pre-process the data, we remove the baseline, and so on. And this is something we get out of it. So here, you can see that it has fairly large amount of noise. And for example, uh, if I go to position two and position three. So I will just go a little bit back. So here, this was the data that was gathered from sensor B here. And these positions were two and three. So here I can see that there was a huge change because I was standing very near to the sensor. But in the other positions, when I move away from the sensor, uh, the information is somewhat lost between the, in the environmental noise and so on. And that is beyond the human inference at this point. So uh, at this point, we will employ the machine learning algorithms. So I had the four uh, streams of data coming from four sensors. Oh, by the way, and this is the what we get. I mean, this is what we want to achieve. We give in the garbage data, and we expect some information out of it. Um, one more thing, uh, how we can use this data. So uh, there are like two ways we can use this data. One is we classify between different positions. So in inside a smart home, that would essentially mean uh, you specify that how much a person uh, is spending time uh, on his bed, on the sofa, or while cooking, or while performing different activities there. So we classify between different positions that a person is spending time there. And the other one is behavioral tracking, that we want to see if a person is walking inside a home, uh, if he's walking fine, if he's, uh, there's no change uh, in his usual movements and so on, and if he's not suddenly falling down or something. So there are like two ways. One is we classify between different positions, and the other is we see if his walking trajectory is OK. So for the classification, for classifying between different positions, uh, we tried a large number of machine learning algorithms. And on top, you see some of the results uh, uh, from, the, from some of the good ones. And uh, on top, we have the classical machine learning algorithms. And bottom three are the boosting algorithms, which work on top of the uh, machine other machine learning algorithms. And we achieved something like of more than 93% of accuracy uh, while we try to classify between different positions. Um, uh, just one aspect of the machine learning stuff that uh, we gathered something like 40 different experiments, and we divided them between. 75% uh, training and 25% uh, of the test data. And we randomized the data and uh, had multiple runs to see that if it's uh, significant, uh, the results are like uh, not r random or something. Now moving to the other aspect, which is 
if we, re we try to reconstruct the trajectory of the person, uh, his movement inside a home. And for that one, we will explore different neural networks. Um, so, as opposed to the other experiment, we had to perform this experiment where two systems were running at the same time. Uh, we had our test system and we had the other system that, uh, which was providing us the precise X and Y locations. So, we had our four capacitive sensors running in this uh, virtual room. And we had the other labeling system, which was labeling the data as we were moving around in the inside, the in inside that space. So these were the ultrasound sensors, and but here we need uh, a person to carry the tag all the time. So uh, we'll know that what are the X and Y coordinates of the person while he's moving around and the uh, data is coming out from the capacitive sensors. Um, so this is what the trajectory of the person looks like when he was moving around, uh, a nice spaghetti. And uh, out of this data, we will uh, we, d we divide it between training, validation, and testing. So that was 60% for uh, training, 20% for validation, and 20% for testing. Uh, just to give the idea that what the sensor output looks like, this was after the pre-processing. Uh, so here you see, uh, so the above one, this is the output from the sensor. And the lower one is the distance of the person from the sensor. And if you can see to the positions where w the distance is less, we see quite a strong signal. But as the distance increases, the information is uh, some again lost in the in the noise uh, that is again beyond the human inference. So we provide these four streams of data like this to the to the neural networks, and we will see how different neural networks perform. So we started with a very simple feed-forward neural network, and where we provide four. Uh, of four different values of the sensor, so one from each, and we provide them to the uh, a fully connected layer and it gives us the X and Y coordinates. And this is something we achieve. So here our goal is to, to we want to see that what exactly is the distance from the actual position and also how smooth is the trajectory. So because smoothness is also important that so a sober person doesn't uh, it's not uh, detected as someone who was drunk in the home uh, because he's moving around here and there. Uh, so here we see certain f fair amount of oscillations. And so what we do is we change the way how we provide the data to the network. And for that one, we provide a window of the data. So we provide some of the past values and some of the future values. So we, uh, we input a pattern inside the neural network and it certainly smoothens somewhat the, the output of the uh, network. Uh, similarly, we explore other networks. One is 1D convolution with different settings. And uh, the convolution neural networks are quite well known in the image processing uh, domain because they are known to extract the features of the data. So we try to see that uh, here is what we wanted to see was that if it can extract the features of the uh, uh, from the data which are related to the movement of the person. And we, uh, the results were better in terms of RMSC here. And we also explored the LSTM uh, because in this, uh, LSTMs are known for uh, sequences where the data has some context. So to see how the context is important here. And what we see here is the, the data output was certainly more smoother as compared to the other neural networks. Even though the problem here was that it was missing uh, with a significant margin some of the target values, but the overall the output was smoother. Uh, here's the comparison for the floating point operations and the parameters. So that in the end, it depends that uh, if you want to use uh, the system on a uh, certain embedded system with limited resources. So we will see that what was, what's our target that we want to achieve and how much space that we have in terms of parameters and floating point operations, for example. For example, LSTM here had 
uh, fewer floating point operations and parameters, while the error was uh, less in the 1D convolution neural network. So that pretty much concludes the presentation. Uh, this is the, so here the blue one is the inference and the red one is the actual, uh, actual trajectory of the movement. So we demonstrated that we can use such sort of sensors to classify between different positions and we can also use such sensors with 25 centimeter of the RMSC. Uh, to to see uh, to reconstruct the trajectory of the of the person and his movements, and that concludes the presentation. Thanks. Thank you.